So um, I, as far as I know, everybody's back now. Um, I still see some people coming in slowly. And maybe I'll ask my colleagues to help us with admitting people into the waiting room. I still see some people there. And at this point, I'm actually going to dis disable the ability for people to um, mute and unmute themselves, only the uh, rapporteurs and the session leads. So if the team around the room can just um, be sure that everybody who is supposed to have a co-chair does have co-chair. Um, okay. So um, I will rely on the DGC team to just check to make sure the session leads and the rapporteurs um, are able to mute and unmute themselves. And if there's somebody who needs the floor, um, I will uh, follow the leads of the people who have run the sessions and then we'll give them that floor. So if we're ready to go, um, should we start with um, um, session one, our common agenda? And we can uh, hear what you guys uh, discussed and came up with, your takeaways. Over to you, session leads and rapporteurs. Thank you, Hala. Thank you. We had a great session. So I'll start and then I'll bounce it over to Daniel. Um, so the first question we addressed was, what would represent a breakthrough for you in terms of global governance today? And a lot of great points came up. We had a great dynamic discussion. Um, the first being multilingualism for equitable access and fostering dialogue. Um, then someone had highlighted um, that there's there's a dangerous attempt in trying to really bring corporations into the same level and decision making possibilities as the countries themselves. Um, so that was highlighted. Um, then there was a real focus on grounding in the local and in the regional um, and, you know, having the, that be the center and the axis of change and having the national and the global um, really follow follow suit. Um, so that was a really interesting point, you know, city leadership as well as being a powerful place for change to happen. Um, and then one of the biggest points that came through is just really needing to come to terms with the reality that we're one humanity sharing one planet. Um, and, and that if we are to have sustainable development or regenerative development in the future, um, shifting the metrics by which we're measuring societal well-being and success away from things like GDP and towards other metrics of health and well-being um, and really regrounding policy, global coordination, um, all facets of our society's functioning in an ethic of care and care that spans across generations, care that spans to the planet. Um, and looking to the communities who really embody that um, for their leadership and guidance. And over to Daniel. Yeah, thanks so much, Nadine. And thank you to all in the group for wonderful contributions. I'm gonna share a little bit about how we can ensure that some voices who haven't been heard as much in the past are able to uh, participate in these conversations. <clears throat> and then what future opportunities would be like for the UN and DGC uh, and global civil society to do. Uh, and these two things actually go hand in hand. And it starts with uh, something that Nadine said, which is just that, that right now, the way the world is, we have to recognize that we are all kind of in this, in this together, as is now a cliche. Uh, but what that means is that we need to approach uh, our diverse constituencies in a way where we are uh, trying to learn from each other and enhance each other's contributions. So youth is not just for youth and indigenous, not just for indigenous and cities, not just for cities, but all of us for all of us. And, but you know, based on that expertise. And then this also means that there needs to be greater dialogue between member states, UN and civil society. And I think space, you know, what I heard was that spaces like this are really excellent in order for us to uh, cohere around some of our, our thoughts, but then how they actually make it to the hallowed halls of the United Nations and, and, and our various capitals is kind of the next question that we have to engage with. So what kinds of spaces can we create of, of mutual collaboration? Uh, how can we uh, ensure that, that we're not reinforcing some of these silos that have been created before? Um, how can we really go deep into those thematic areas of expertise? Again, whether it's linguistic issues or uh, you know, it, it, any kind of populate, any kind of issue, gender equality, all of this, how can we ensure that these things actually speak to each other, but also we get that degree of expertise? And it may be that the different meeting spaces with diverse participants that focus on these uh, different issues could be helpful. Um, but really it is at this moment in history about us collectively searching for solutions. Um, and that's what our common agenda seems to represent is one uh, example from which we can learn certain lessons and, and cautionary tales, 
about how, uh, how we en envision the future together. And I think these kinds of spaces and others like it that will hopefully be created by DGC and by us can serve us uh, to, to all explore this reality together because ultimately we're trying to create a world and a, and, a, and a humanity that has never before existed. Thanks. I think back to you, Hawa. Okay, thank you. I, I, you know, I was, <laughs> I was lost in all what you're saying. So I'm expecting to even hear more. But thank you so much. That's super awesome. I kind of had a time to sort of creep into a, a, a few minutes into all of the different rooms. So definitely, thank you so much for, um, you know, those takeaways and really looking forward to see how we can, kind of put everything together in a comprehensive way and to see, you know, what's next for all of us. So should we move to session two, which I think was the climate um, justice agenda, if I'm correct? Over to yeah. you, co-leads and rapporteurs. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Hawa. Um, so basically we had a great discussion. And in fact, it was a multilingual discussion. We had some you know, like participation uh, from colleagues uh, who spoke in French and uh, thanks to Madeline for translating that into English. So uh, we literally had a multilingual session. So that was like, that was a lot of fun. And thanks for everyone for participating. Um, so basically we start with um, sort of like setting the stage, you know, where the world stands in, term of, in terms of climate change. And we all know like uh, current warming justice component where basically um, we have seen some progress uh, last year uh, but that's definitely you know like nowhere near enough and basically to be able to preserve a livable climate um, you know uh, greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced to net zero by 2050 and of course uh, the justice part of it is G20 is responsible for almost 80 percent of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, but uh, they're not taking enough Action. And then we basically, uh, fo following up on that, uh, we opened the floor for uh, definition of climate justice and what are the key issues under that and gender definitely falls under it. And basically we heard from different people how women are being affected by climate, uh, by the climate emergency and how despite their being on the resource or on the recognized, women actually are taking the lead, taking climate action uh, at all levels as farmers, as producers, as workers, consumers, household managers, and they shared, in fact, uh, we have heard very good examples from the audience. They shared um, some examples from their communities, cities, uh, countries, how women participate in, and take the lead on, um, take the lead in climate action. So that was from our session, but happy to hear from our wonderful uh, reporters and also from my, uh, our colleague Osama, if they have anything else to add. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Esra. I would, I mean, you summed it up pretty well. I would just add one or two points, uh, especially for me. I mean, the connection between climate change and gender was really insightful. We touched upon so many aspects of it. Uh, uh, it was really enlightening. Uh, also, Beth, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was the one, and the point really stick, stuck to me. It was uh, amongst the other points that we need to, you know, uh, reuse things. It, there was another point that was highlighted, which was we need to refuse extra consumption, which was, I think, one of the key takeaways of the whole session, because, uh, you know, as Esra mentioned, we talked about the discrepancy between North and South. And I think this really speaks to the overall overarching debate of of the whole mind, mind process, you know, of all the whole thought process that how we need to reframe things. So that was re really brilliant. And over to the reporters, that was all from my side. Um, I guess um, Usama and uh, Estra kind of summed up everything, but one thing that I want to kind of emphasize was the point on including women uh, in decision making and um, also uh, informing them of the benefits of uh, climate justice. So that's one of the major points that I kind of uh, was very interested in and something that everyone sort of emphasized on. Aishu, if you have anything to add. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Tiloka. And all three of you brilliantly summed up the all of the interventions from our conversation. But yes, just to highlight on the gender budgeting and how climate finance also 50% of it actually is also to go towards resilience and climate adaptation in, in addition. And I know that some of our 
colleagues who joined mentioned of best practices, which Esra had mentioned. And another aspect we can add is also climate smart um, agriculture. And as we have many women who are also farmers in, um, especially in the continent of Africa, this is where again, that bridge between climate justice and gender equality really uh, is evident. So thank you very much to all. And I pass it over back to you, Hawa. Thanks so much to this team. This seems like it was a super exciting uh, discussion. I wish I could have attended all of them, but this one is uh, one also we've done a briefing on, but we're learning a bit more about you know climate and just gender equality in general. So I hope that maybe moving forward we can maybe dig deeper and have more sessions um, you know um, that you know focus on this. I know that Ezra um, has a, a another a meeting she needs to attend. So if there are any last minute questions for Ezra before she goes, speak now or forever hold your peace. Going once, twice, three times, and it's sold. Thank you so much, Ezra. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you again to our platform. And a big thanks to everybody who did the climate justice agenda. So now, should we go to the third one? Is it comms um, one, two, three? One of my favorites? Yes, it is. Hi, okay. Howard. Over to uh, you, Connor. Yes, so this was kind of the meta discussion because it was a discussion held over Zoom about doing communication via Zoom and the pros and cons of that. Um, so obviously it's, made, it's been a huge shift for everyone in, in a personal life, in work life, and obviously communications with regards to outreach and advocacy, it's been very difficult. And we talked to, about many different subjects. I'll, I'll uh, lean on uh, Alibe, my co-lead and the rapporteurs to fill in the blanks. But uh, misinformation is obviously something that has really come to the fore and has been, a, it was a big problem before, but it's been exacerbated in the time when so many people are relying on channels of communication which are prone to misinformation, fake news, campaigns run by malicious uh, people. And the UN has been a big victim of that as well. Um, even with COVID-19, which we've been we feel we've been talking about constantly for the last two years at the Secretariat and also World Health Organization, UNICEF and other agencies, that there is still a lot of fake news out there, a lot of misinformation. And even people at the UN um, have, I've seen, been, uh, been hit by this themselves. Uh, mental health came up uh, quite a lot. It's been affecting our mental health, it's been affecting my mental health, it's, and many people have felt very isolated and had to adjust to this so-called new normal of being at home a lot more than many of us were. And uh, one great point from Jim Claffey that he's hoped this doesn't become the new normal, that we get back to more face-to-face -face interaction because he feels, and, and I would tend to agree with that, that the, the less nuanced, more antagonistic world online has seeped into real life. And Jim was saying that he's found people when he's driving to be a lot less tolerant than, than they used to be and a lot more a lot quicker to rise to anger and we're seeing this in the political sphere as well that more extremist parties messages are getting through much more easily or so it seems than they did before the pandemic so rather than going on a bit more i think you know it's high time to hand over to alibe and then our rapporteurs alibe hi everyone <laughs> This was a great conversation. It's going fantastic. So um, part of what um, um, Connor mentioned, uh, you know, this uh, how it's affecting us uh, mentally and uh, mentally and actually physically because we have seen a lot of people not really moving much, staying at home. But <laughs> I think that one of the most clear uh, points that I could bring out is that. For every point that we saw a negative, we also seen a positive. So as Connor mentioned, we have a lot of people in uh, sending out fake information in the news, but then we have a lot of people who are creating these wonderful platforms and trying to connect to communities. As, as I did uh, with my partner, Jeff, we created Unprecedented Journey uh, during the year, the first year of COVID, just to showcase um, how people should uh, manage 
management of health, how to learn about the signals of, you know, find the signals when, when am I getting sick mentally and I'm not taking care of myself. Um, we also did something on um, a lot of people bought a lot of food uh, during COVID and then they didn't know what to do because they didn't want to go to the supermarket all the time. And one of those um, uh, episodes was, I did the episode on how to prevent food from perishing so quickly and learn different recipes and freeze and, you know, all being sustainable, trying to be conscious and also keep, uh, keep a watch on your wallet, right? During these difficult times. So I think that, I mean, we have, um, we can really connect so much physically to people, but we have access to more people. Um, and I think that when he, um, that's one of the pro and cons, right? We also learned that uh, because we are living through this moment that we can really um, connect and it's only through cameras, then we, we finally see our families or we try to hold on to our families more now and pay more attention to our friends. Um, in terms of um, in terms of education, we tapped on uh, how difficult it was for students to connect, which I'm going to leave to Mariela to describe more on that. We also talked about uh, having this, um, as Connor mentioned, this blog that uh, now it become more. Uh, you can reach more people, but then we have these entities or even people themselves putting these walls that you know I don't want to talk or be rich. Um, anymore or until I have my time. And, it, and we have seen it with government agencies. Um, we also felt it a little bit with the UN when at the beginning, everybody was trying to figure out what to do. And we could only have access to an email service where you can send an email, not even to a person. Uh, that was frustrating, <laughs> but understandably so for what we were going. And now the UN is back online and we are having access, but some other agencies are not giving that yet. So all those, those points that um, we have not all been aware of became aware on the conversation. So I'm passing it now to Mariela. Are you there? Yes. So going off of what Alive and Connor mentioned, I think there's definitely positives and negatives to every change that's come with the COVID pandemic, because it made a small, more connected world where everybody is able to join a meeting sometimes people have different times and schedules and everybody will be able to join and network that way but then then there are the downsides such as what levy mentioned in his country of zambia of how there are many people who did not have access to tv or digital things and people without access to facebook him and people from the un actually had to go and recruit people in person because it was just so difficult, but then there are also restrictions that prevented reaching those people. So it often drove like a brick wall between that type of effort. But in other ways, it definitely made people more connected because at all times people were able to go online and find different ways to network and find a Zoom that they could connect to for COVID. Wow, thanks okay. so much. Um, uh, did we get everybody on this team? Levy, over to yes, you. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, it was a very great discussion because uh, I'm saying it was great because we had people from different regions, people explaining their experiences and also what uh, how they've been impacted and uh, affected by this COVID-19. So we've learned a lot of things, uh, the positive, the negatives, and also it has been noted that uh, a lot of people they've had access to information but also it was observed to say that uh, the impact, uh, uh, it, has, it has brought the negativity also to the side of the civil society organization because uh, you can't advocate, you know, the impact when you're advocating online and also with face-to-face -face is different. So uh, it was noted to say something has been negative, even though people have had information, but uh, the information also what solution are we bringing so they were saying the suggestions were like uh, we should try so hard that we have also our physical meetings where we can face the government where we can also uh, meet physically and uh, advocate uh, uh, as as it has been before so it was so great with Kona, Alibe and um, Mariela thank you very much 
Thank you so much. That sounds like that was such a great conversation. And, you know, for me, I think I've learned so much just being online and our team as well. Um, and, you know, just the fact that we've been able to reach out and touch people all over, but then the reality that, you know, we run into problems online in terms of access and infrastructure. I heard somebody was mentioning, you know, strengthening infrastructure as, well as part of one of the SDGs. It's so real if you're in the global South. It was so easy for us here in some parts of the world to, hey, we're moving online, let's pivot to online. But many people in the global South didn't even have access before COVID-19. But it's interesting to hear when you talk about communications you're, and, and how we're using communications, like you said, Alibe for food supplies to you know, get information and not thinking about communication like straight mass communication. So for me, that's very enlightening for me, even working at the UN and really grateful. You know, it's the thing about COVID-19 that we had a lot of ups and downs and negative things, but it's also been a time as they say in crisis where just innovation and new ideas pop out. So definitely wanna continue this conversation. Now I have to apologize to the next group because this is like one of my favorites. I know you're probably saying, how are you saying that about every group? And I am, but honestly, intergenerational collaboration, working with young people, I feel so useful all the time in the way I'm thinking, in the way I look, I hope you agree. Uh, I've learned so much from the young people that I'm working with and I've equally learned as much from the NGO uh, seasoned experts that I've been working with also. So um, it's really with great pleasure that I'm inviting the people from intergenerational collaboration. And I apologize for um, uh, pulling Safin away, you know, with uh, this technology thing, something always happens. And usually when it does, I freak out for a couple of seconds and then I start to think. So thank you very much Safin for coming to our aid and helping us to kind of really effectively distribute everybody. I hope that we didn't affect your session uh, that much, but the co-leads, Margo, Safin and the uh, Rapporteurs were there, a super, super good people. So I'm sure you had a great conversation. Over to you, thank you. Thanks, thanks. So I can start off and then give it off to Rapporteur and then Margot can wind up and summarize. Um, yes, they were all waiting for me. <laughs> they were all were wondering where this guy got. But yeah, we had a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, was a pleasure co-facilitating with this Margot. And um, thanks a lot to Patrick, Faith, Karma, Mark, Holly, Saroni, Tatiana, Linda, Deborah, Faisal, Graciela, and Teddy for making this a very engaging conversation. I hope I haven't missed any. Um, we started off by discussing about what are the different roadblocks to intergenerational collaboration. We talked about you know, how youth are many times not respectful towards the older generation. Uh, they feel that they don't need to listen to the older generation and um, you know, who, who are you to tell us or mentor things to us, right? And then the, on the other side, the older generation feels that they don't have anything to learn from the youth. Um, essentially what happens is it's a close mindset from both set of generations. And, and then there's the non-acceptance to youth views and just giving them an opportunity to share something just for the sake of lip service and not taking any action on it, right? At the end of the day, both of the two groups are not receptive to each other. So we looked at how can, what are the roadblocks and how can we take care of these? Uh, we looked at how do we involve youth more in taking action towards the SDGs and different issues that our world is facing. And then we spoke about how to facilitate intergenerational collaboration. So to share more on these points, I'd like to invite my rapporteur, Ashley. Ashley, over to you. Okay, um, so I'll talk about um, some few direction that our group has discussed as uh, for things moving forward. So the first one is to facilitate inclusive um, and you know intergenerational collaboration. We need more uh, people to realize the importance of collaboration and also inclusiveness. And the second one is to um, promote more um, entrepreneurship among the youth community with the help of the seniors providing training and instructions so these two generations can actually work together um, to uh, serve something meaningful. And the third one is to give young people an opportunity to share their views and to listen to young people of the world that they want. So often, uh, maybe uh, the elder generation would be like, um, they just want young people to build on what they have built and just to like go on, go on afterwards. So we want to actually listen to young people of what kind of world, what is their aspiration, and then uh, to take action on what the young people have shared. 
And then the next one is to facilitate reverse mentoring. This is pretty interesting uh, when we discuss about this. We actually need more open-minded uh, people because like what uh, Safin has mentioned, often, you know, like two generations has their own thoughts and not listening to each other. But we need to have more open-minded people and more mutual respect, especially. So it's not like the young people must respect those that have experience or the um, elder generation must respect the young people, but a mutual respect needs to be um, achieved. And we also talk about need to have age balance at decision making place. So we need to involve more young people on the board of organizations. And it is also important to have a proper structure to accommodate the voice of young people. So often we might see that um, there's lack of um, youth representative at the decision making table and this is something that is critical and the final thing that we talk about is to remove the focus on age we shouldn't make like age is something that we keep focusing on but rather we need to focus on the way we work and the values that each other could bring to something that we are working on so we need to remove the barrier of age like not asking like oh you're old you're young so this is a um, few things that we have discussed um, if Margot you want to add something Yeah, I just think uh, it was everything that we just talked about was it was totally organic. It came from heart. Everybody, uh, we really felt collaboration and being open to each other and communication. And it's just so important. And uh, it, everybody had examples of how they put this into their own good practice. And we also asked each other, how can we help each other? So there was co collaboration and cooperation happening right within our own room. And I do, I will be reaching out myself to some of you because I really feel we can perhaps learn from each other and actually grow as well. I just want to take a moment to really thank uh, uh, our colleagues with the uh, Department of Global Communications for actually facilitating another opportunity for us to come together and engage not only did we learn from each other, we got to know each other. Thank you, Hawa. Thank you, the team, all of you, Judith, uh, Swati, everybody here, to everyone who supported us. Thank you so much. It was, an it was an absolute pleasure to be there today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margo, Safin, and Ashley. It sounds like it was really an awesome discussion. I hope that with all of these discussions, we'll be able to you know, get a little bit more of the narrative and see what we can put together uh, to share beyond the tape. And, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking like, you know, I'm hearing people, what next, what next? You know, I hope that there will be a, a what next pretty soon and that we can work together to plan that out. Um, so why don't we move on next? Can, to Hama, the, can I just add one quick thing? Sure, please go I ahead. Do, I do want to say, I think the technical glitches in an odd way bonded us even closer because we all pitched in together. So there are no accidents in some of these things. It was just, you know, an opportunity for us to go with the flow and make it happen and make it the success that this actually has become. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Saffron, for you. being so helpful to everybody else. We waited Thank for you. you. Thank you. <laughs> we waited Thank you for so you. much. I always Thank say you. these briefings are like a wedding. Our team, we planned, planned. We were up, uh, we were up early this morning, testing everything. Everything was good. We were all smiley. And like I said, when things start to go left field, we usually, I freak out for a couple of seconds and then have to pull myself back together. It's always like a wedding, I say, no matter how much you plan, you're gonna be at that wedding table and something's gonna happen and you're just gonna have to figure out a way to go there's, with the flow and not jump across the uh, the, the bridal table. So thank you so a, much again, yeah, as you said, There's Margo. always a surprise, Hawa, right? There's always a surprise. Awesome, but we pulled thank it. You. Thanks so much, everybody. Why don't we move over? We still have two more left. Why don't we do um, uh, counterterrorism? I don't have them in any order. I took notes and I'm kind of, uh, Counterterrorism, I think we have and tackling discrimination. So uh, over to you guys. I can start with uh, giving some feedback and then maybe I'll hand over to my colleague Petrida and Sarah as note taker awesome. if he wants to join in as well. So um, we had a really lively conversation. Um, I would say, you know, we definitely tackled some of the threats and challenges that civil society face. You know, we talked a bit about the politicization of counter-terrorist um, efforts and how this can lead to um, attacks on certain communities and how to maybe think about safeguarding against that. We also talked about the challenges or the dangers of the instrumentalization of uh, civil society in, in the service of counter-terrorism objectives. Um, related to that, we also talked about the need to have safe spaces for civil society working in these areas, safe spaces to communicate 
and share um, share knowledge. So the real um, the need to protect civil society in that sense. We talked a lot about uh, the need for local, really um, genuinely local initiatives, you know, and maybe local sometimes isn't local enough, you know, as local as you can get, even local organizations sometimes need to go one step further and think about who they can reach and who they're trying to reach at the end of that. So we talked a lot about the role of outsiders and the real value of listening, you know, um, and, and making this kind of local connections. Um, lively conversation around youth. Uh, some great sort of um, ideas there, some sort of comments that often youth are just, you know, sort of used as, oh, we have a youth voice or, OK, the youth are, you know, they're implementing this activity for us, whereas, you know, there needs to be a lot more done to have that genuine uh, inclusion of youth right from the beginning of initiatives. And we also talked about how, um, you know, maybe people need to really um, take a seat at the table, even if it's not being offered and how to encourage that for certain voices and communities. Um, other conversations, we talked about the real value of multilateral approach. We discussed whether this needs to be global, regional, local, you know, the value of sharing expertise and learning from different sectors. Um, and also we talked about maybe um, the need for the for the UN particularly um, and international organizations to genuinely learn from CSOs. We need to maybe hear more from CSOs, you know, there is quite a lot of engagement and quite a lot of platforms for engagement, but really, really understanding what they need. And so we definitely need to get that from CSOs and, you know, we encourage that from CSOs and need to maybe put in place better systems and platforms to have that ongoing, genuine connection uh, with civil society. And then sort of final takeaway would be just the value of talking and keeping these kind of things going. And I know already from the conversation there were sort of networking happening in the chat and verbally as well, offers to sort of make connections. So uh, yeah, just thank you to the organizers. I thought it was a really valuable event. Um, Petrida, did you want to add anything? Well, uh, thanks so much, first of all, Caroline, and um, all our colleagues uh, that joined us through the session. I think the main thing that I would like to add is a, a reiteration of putting most of the recommendations into actions. So actually actualizing the discussions, actualizing the need uh, of everyone's intervention, uh, how best uh, do we take on the next steps to ensure they're materialized? Uh, so that's it from my side. Okay, can you all hear me? Uh, Sarah, yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, from our discussion, we also talked about um, creating a safe space for CSOs to communicate freely with the, with the UN because of the issue of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism is a very sensitive issue, you know, so the need for creation of safe space for communication. And then we also mentioned about uh, how to communicate the UN agenda into local uh, languages, local to local communities, so that everyone will be will have understanding on what to do and how to go about it, and also create awareness in that regard. Uh, I think uh, that, and then and then we talked about the online space, online. Uh, social media, the effect of social media and how it promotes extremism and all of that. So there's need to watch out uh, on that space as well. So um, we also mentioned about having key actors, enshrining the key actors into, uh, you know, identifying commonalities in order to engage with the CSOs. I think that is it from my end. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is such a very important topic. And, you know, I was speaking to Caroline earlier from the Office of Counterterrorism is that I, I've never done a briefing on counterterrorism. And I think it's one that I really want to delve into with civil society, because I think, you know, we all, you know, you have a role to play. So this was kind of like a tester for us. So, I mean, uh, give me a feel, give me a thumbs up with your emoji if you think this is something that we should continue working on and have like a, a unique briefing. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure Caroline must have told you, Counterterrorism Office, I've been like oh, like blown away with all the awesome and innovative work that they're doing. You know, when I have time, I stalk other UN offices on social media and in their websites. And I was just surprised they do, talking to everybody from civil society, to you, to the private sector, 
So definitely um, it's something that I want us to work on to have a unique briefing where we have different perspectives coming on. So Caroline and everybody else in this team, thank you so much for sure. Uh, we in DGC will be reaching out to you to see how we can maybe work on something together or you can support us. Thank you. So last but not least, we have the uh, session on tackling uh, um, discrimination. It's one I wanted to attend, but then um, I was sort of going around from room to room so I can hardly wait to see what happened here. So uh, Adama um, and uh, Tahil and, uh, and your rapporteurs, over to you. I'm not to you, mind. <laughs> sure, no problem, no problem, no problem here. Um, hello everyone, nice to meet you all. We had a rich discussion. Um, it's an interesting topic. Um, I said up front that um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a consultant to a couple of agencies and civil society organizations. So when, in, when the murder of George Floyd happened and people were like, oh wait, racism is a thing. It meant that um, you know, I got a lot of calls and I got, and I specialize in working with international development organizations. So we started off this discussion talking about whether, how it feels, whether you feel like you can show up as your true self to the organization that you work in. And my experiences, are, unfortunately, of several UN organizations is that you can't. Um, it's incredibly hierarchical and leaders often set the agenda of how you can show up. Um, and I am using the experience of working for myself and being someone who's a bit of an interloper. I just find that when I can show up in the workplace as my true self, um, my work is far much more, far better and I'm more innovative and I can really, you know, bring myself to the conversation. We talked about how it'd be so great if all civil societies, organizations were like that all of the time, but it's incredibly difficult. Um, we touched on how digital interesting has come up now a few times, but how the move to Zoom and digital interactions in a way have helped some people show up as their true self to their organization, not having to kind of um, play the rules of, uh, deal with the rules of engagement and also having access to people who are far more senior. Um, funnily, the, the digital engagement has allowed that to take place, but obviously um, issues with differences in um, um, internet access and availability of devices is something that obviously affects inclusion and belonging. Making the point that um, a lot of organizations jump straight to diversity um, and trainings and things like that without realizing that you cannot ask someone like me or any organization to be like, devise a plan for us to recruit more black people, more disabled people, more people who feel free to talk about their mental health without making sure that the organization is one where people feel included and feel like they can belong. And a lot of organizations really don't realize that to tackle diversity effectively, they need to assess the ability, the level to which people can show up as their true selves and feel a sense of belonging in the environment. Um, otherwise, just jumping to hiring a bunch of people that you think meets a quota is not going to work because those people are going to walk, walk, walk into your weird hierarchical organizations and walk straight back out again. Um, we touched on the fact that we all have biases that we need to deal with. If we have the power to and we feel safe to, we really need to speak up about that. Um, sometimes we have our own things. So you may be a black woman, and so you're really interested in anti-racism and gender, but it's super important that you start reading up about disability rights, critical diversity, um, queer experiences, and, and, and actually becoming an ally to other um, groups but also seeing that the learnings you get from the critical writings around other disability, um, other aspects of identity are actually super useful for the, own, um, the way in which you experience the world as well. Tahil, I'm quite certain that I did not touch on everything there. Um, so I am gonna go back to you um, to just uh, do your magic as you always do. Thank you, Adanma, I appreciate it. Uh, you definitely summed up a lot of major points and I think, um, a couple of major um, tangible things that I think our space was able to offer is based on a lot of our individual role in trying to address discrimination. At the end of the day, it takes our collective and the groundswell necessary to be able to make you know, reforms and changes in the face of so much power and tyranny and everything that's going on. But it requires first and foremost to see where our individual power is in this space. 
Each of us is complicated and an intersection of so many different identities. So each of us also has a responsibility to make sure that all of those identities are represented in the spaces that we stand in and where we make decisions. Uh, if you have to check any part of yourself at the door, that's not fair to you and that's not fair to the process of equity. So please remember that every aspect of who you are visually and inside is an important part of what brings these conversations to the level that they need to be at. Secondly, don't forget that the work against discrimination is not always revolutionary. A lot of it is very incremental. Each of us has to be able to challenge the work that happens in legislation, in governance, in major organizations and institutions. But many of us have to start within our own homes and communities with addressing language, culture, practices, and so much more to be able to step away from the level of discrimination that might happen. It's being mindful of words that might actually center anti-Blackness or homophobia. It's thinking about the different opinions and attitudes that we have towards trans people and people of color. It starts with those individual ways and have, creating a paradigm shift that's so necessary that hopefully will help in the process of creating the groundswell in the future that can help make bigger change. Um, but the third thing that you have to do is actually very simple and something that we can all think about. Whenever you ask someone a question, don't answer the question for them if you're trying to learn about someone new. Many times we like to be in spaces and say, ah, we see this person who in my head fits in this box. So I'm gonna ask the question as if that person is exactly what I think they are. And what we end up doing is embarrassing ourselves because that person ends up not being the religion you're thinking, the ethnicity or culture, or going through a specific experience. So rather than asking, oh, are you this specific thing? Ask them who they are. Ask them what their experience and journey is. Learn about their story and be a better listener rather than putting them in a box that you have no idea exists. The more that we engage in that kind of deeper listening for storytelling, the better we can actually build bridges with people that are different from us. And that may not seem tangible to these larger ideas of how we understand the work of addressing discrimination systemically, but it actually has to start at a point where you care enough about the person to pay attention and to learn about them before you go into the world trying to help them. And I'd like to turn it over to our rapporteurs if they'd like to say anything as well, Max and Wanto. All right, um, maybe I can go first. But thank you so much, uh, our uh, leads, uh, for giving us a heads up almost everything what transpired. I'm just going to add uh, my voice on how uh, the, the different routes and which the conversation took. Uh, so one of the things was that we all acknowledge the fact that uh, discrimination takes away various forms and types. Uh, so. As we approach it, it is not, it's not a one size fit. So it needs to also the approach to tackling, it needs to take still various ways and forms uh, so that each aspect is addressed. Say for example, gender discrimination for us needs to take a different approach from um, uh, maybe uh, economic uh, discrimination in, in a way. So say for example, you come from the global south, um, the, the way they, they need to tackle is different from someone who comes from, you know, a different area. So that also came out as an agreement. So as we work towards the tangible, actionable uh, 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 ways to tackle this, we need to, uh, it's, uh, we, it's important to acknowledge that. And also some of the things that came out uh, from the discussion since we actually had the consultant in the area was that uh, yes, most organizations are taking a very positive route to actually uh, put this into perspective, acknowledge this, they even hire consultants to, to, to make an analysis of what, how, which gap is existing and how they can fill it. Uh, and then they come up with amazing reports uh, about it. However, the missing link is the action, uh, the action. So after that, what happens after the reports have been written by the consultant, uh, after, um, of course, you presented it to the stakeholders, what happens next? So uh, because of that, we also took an approach of encouraging action oriented approach. And one way of dealing, do, dealing with it is an accountability partner. 
someone needs to check with you, hey, I wrote this report, or oh, this was presented, what, how far have you gone? And so because of that, uh, we requested, or we are urging people who are part of this platform, especially if you're in the leadership position, a decision-making position in your entity, because it needs to start with us. It's important for you to always make sure that we put, uh, we take action because these reports come with recommendations which are structured. So there is always a baby step, a first step. So at least you need to take steps forward so that at the end of the day, you will be able to be fulfilled that, okay, this is what I started and this is where it is ending. Yeah, and that also brings us back to uh, individual people action. Uh, just like Tahil said, that it's an incremental kind of uh, way. So each, if each one of us takes an action towards having an inclusive and, uh, uh, environment, starting from our workspaces, starting from our homes, it, it, it will eventually have a ripple effect that, okay, the other people will see the, 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 the value in it, and then you know, they'll be able to, 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 to extend. So I, I also want to talk, touch about remote work which most people have already actually talked about, but then we took a different perspective that uh, it has been more valuable uh, in, uh, in, in helping to bridge the gap uh, or to bring more inclusion into the different aspects uh, or different forms of inclusion. For example, the youth, the young people have, been got, have got spaces to get involved in, different genders, the people from the global south like myself, some from Uganda. Yes, so that uh, remote work has also helped. And the reason uh, it has helped more is because it tackles more factors which are beyond ourselves, beyond our organization. Say, for example, the immigration systems. So if you need to have more inclusive environment, you need to have people from the global south to work for you. Someone cannot get a visa to the United States because of certain reasons. So now if someone is working remotely, they don't need a visa. So in such a way, it has also helped to tackle other factors um, which are beyond us who are taking action. So that uh, that is what I wanted to add. So let me hand over to Wanto uh, to also say what we could have missed out. Thank you so much. Wanto, are you still on the session? As we wait to hear from Wanto, why don't I double check um, uh, we have just a couple of minutes. Uh, we are happy to go over just a few minutes, five, 10 minutes in case there are any questions or clarifications. Uh, just to double check, I see that uh, Adma, somebody had asked, what do you mean about your true self? I see you answered that in the chat. I can give you the floor for that, but then I can ask, are there any other rapporteurs or, co or leads who did not get to speak? Uh, for example, I didn't hear from Hannah, maybe she has something to add. Why don't I throw the floor to Adma and then maybe to Hannah? Thank oh, you. Sure. Oh, Wanto is uh, back. Okay, Wanto. Oh, okay, Wanto, sorry. why don't you go first? And just uh, bear in mind, we have a couple of minutes left, but we can go over a few, five, 10 minutes uh, because this is so interesting. Over to you, Wanto. Yeah, then we go uh, to Adma and then to Hana. Over. Okay, thank you so much, Hawa. Uh, and as uh, Tahil, uh, Max, and Adama said, uh, this was a very interesting session. Uh, one critical aspect of it, uh, if you know, this is a very touching topic, and uh, uh, we provide a space where people could listen, uh, they could converse, and uh, could ask questions as well. And uh, the most important thing uh, we saw was uh, there was a specific uh, comment from Rachita. Uh, she said people need to always develop, uh, people will always develop bias on the basis of cultural uh, assumption. And uh, she she believed the most important aspect about it is that we have to be conscious and aware of our bias tendency as well. And uh, also uh, one important uh, thing that I added to the disco is that when we speak about discrimination, especially from an African uh, uh, setting, um, it's like uh, different in terms of orientation and existence as compared to the U.S. And uh, for the U.S., you have issues of George Floyd, uh, Amar Aubrey, Brianna Taylor. You have systemic injustice. Uh, you have years of slavery. You also have policies that may have, you know, to some extent, uh, affected communities who are disproportionately mm -hmm. uh, inherited affected by, you know, racist policies. And uh, you also have police brutality as well. And uh, I think Adaman uh, also has a background with mm -hmm. the apartheid. So. 
it's just two distinct issues, but one, one thing that we were able to achieve is that we were able to come up with some action statement, uh, which was led uh, by the lead. And some of those action statements is that if you see a common legislature, uh, maybe your a lawmaker is creating a policy that does not stand with your values, uh, you know, take actions against it. Uh, <clears throat> if you're in a setting where people are being able to stereotype you, prejudice you, you know, take actions. And uh, if you uh, see discrimination, speak out. And I think those were really important action steps that, you know, each participants in a group can be able to lead forward. And the last thing I would say definitely is it's a really important point uh, that Mass lay out in the discord. Uh, he spoke about, you know, uh, economic, I mean, I lay out the importance of economic uh, exclusion. And then he spoke about young people in the global south, uh, you know, being uh, uh, maybe stereotyped or discriminated from, you know, immigration issues, maybe coming for youth event across the UN and civil society institution. And uh, that was a very important point. And I think going forward, those are, you know, action steps at the UN we can be able to take after COVID-19. How can young people, you know, get access to events and discussions, especially the ones that are far more levier and affected by this kind of, you know, discriminatory uh, and uh, some type of perception. But thank you. And uh, I really love this session. And I'm glad I served as a rapporteur along with Max. <laughs> Thanks so much, Wanto. Uh, Adam, I don't know if you want to say a few words about um, coming as your true self. That's something I'm learning more about myself as well. Over. Sure. So um, if if you can show up in your true self in the workplace, you can actually do your work in a joyful way, in a more effective way, in a more innovative way. And you can actually engage with your um, the people you work with really effectively. But you cannot do this when the prevailing attitude is that um, heter heteronormative whiteness um sorry a hege hegemonic whiteness is the way to be and i use this example because i've worked in the u.n i'm an outsider i'm a i don't care i'm a provocateur i'll say this stuff the big thing that i come across with um staff from the global south is do you know what i had to do to get a job in headquarters i had to take a pay cut i had to improve my english i had to stop bringing my food into the workplace i had to um ask before i spoke up in meetings and that's not a way to engage in the workplace. It's actually truly disturbing. And if someone has all that on their head, in their mind before they go into work, it's they're incapable of doing their work effectively because they're too busy trying to live up to the standards that you believe that someone who was born in Uganda cannot have a P5 level in the UN. If people think that they cannot, um, you know, the education that they, um, they've had, the university that they went to, the fact that they, their language, English is their third language, but they can speak five others, is something that holds them back. They are incapable of in, in bringing their innovation and, and their life experiences, which will actually improve you to, um, to help your organization um, put in programs that will actually work on the ground in the Global South given that you are all based in New York and you do all your work in the Global South. But when people come from the Global South, they can't be their true selves. So inclusion and belonging is about actually allowing people to be their true selves when they come to the workplace. So that's what we were talking about, really. That was the quick, sharp way for me to make mm -hmm. that point pretty bluntly. Thanks so but much for that. That's Thanks what so I much. Thanks, that's enlightening. I, I say my true self, I wanna be able as an African woman to come to work every week with a different hairstyle that has nothing to do with chemicals. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Hawa. Um, so not to reiterate anything that Dan has already said regarding collaboration and partnerships, but I do want to highlight that I, to me, that was really essentially the, 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 the root or the key of what we were trying to get at in our, in our breakout room session. Um, so for example, like the COVID-19 pandemic is, has really highlighted the need for the world to, to work together and help one another. And it's not just about bridging the economic gap between countries, but, but also about bridging the intergenerational gap. Um, we need to communicate and construct meaningful, effective um, dialogue between all generations and, and further the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, um, in a way that, that acknowledges the challenges that each of us face, um, both in a local setting and in a global setting. 
um, and also find solutions that benefit all. So one example that always comes to mind whenever I talk about this is that we, we cannot successfully achieve SDG1 no poverty um, without acknowledging that poverty very often, um, very often continues into the next generation. So the inclusion of youth and interests of future generations in all decision making is incredibly important and, and young people need a permanent seat at every decision making table to, to represent the interests of youth of the world and future generations. So kind of just to summarize um, what I've just said, we essentially need to collaborate um, intergenerationally and bring in youth um, and consider um, future generations. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was really great. Thank you for that addition. Now we're just about uh, at the end of the session. Um, and you really, I wanna thank everybody for, for spending time for us with us today. Uh, we, you know, we probably will stop the recording in a few minutes, but if anybody wants to stay on for another couple of minutes, or if there are any burning questions, I don't know. I feel as if I've learned so much. I mean, for my audience, is there anything that, um, you know, people um, have to ask, or, I mean, as we say, let's, let's, let's have another session. Let's, uh, I don't know how that will work out. We'll have to draw these minds and bodies together again to see how we can work out a session where we can have more people talking. So I don't know if people are in agreement with that, that we stop here and that we continue um, a next time uh, as a follow-up. Let me see some emojis. Let me see some action, everybody. There we go. Can you hear <laughs> yes. me? Yes. I, I, I don't know I who just... that is. There's so many people, so Alibe. many hands. Who is it, Alibe? Uh, yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Alibe, before you start, I just want to tell everybody there's a survey, a link to a survey. If you can kindly okay. just fill that out so we know what you thought about the session and where you want us to go. <laughs> Over to you, Alibe. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add um, just two points. Uh, first of all, with um, Adana, where you uh, just explained, it is so important to continue talking about this conversation and especially to um, you know, the, the youth. So they understand how, because it works both ways. And I went through this experience myself, graduated uh, from a community college, entering uh, Harvard, uh, the Harvard atmosphere, the Harvard club, the interacting with disabled people. And always thinking, because I was told that I was never gonna get to that level and even education wise, you also, uh, as an individual and families are responsible for this, how do you build your child's spirit, right? And one of the things is that um, if you, it is true everything that you said, the way that they set up these um, rules and these uh, systems where uh, certain people are viewed as a minority and they can break that the glass ceiling, right? But if we allow as individuals and we don't work on our true self to break out of that, because we also have to teach others how to treat us. That's super important. And we can't be afraid of doing that. And, and so for all the systems that they are there, that they are preventing us from entering, uh, I love what you just said, you are an outsider, you go and break the rules, you don't care. And that's the attitude that we need to, we really need to show our uh, youth that they need to know that, they need to love themselves, respect themselves, and then anybody who interact with them, well, this is what I bring to the table. And the other thing that I wanted to add uh, was the, the fact that, uh, talking about in my panel about how during the pandemic, uh, the outreach and the advocacy, uh, how much we did or we didn't do um, by using Zoom and by using technology and all that. This is fantastic. This is a proof of my, my panel, what it can be possible. We learn about so many topics and uh, just listening to so many perspectives and being connected to so many people around the world at the same, at the same time. How are you must do something <laughs> other than this one? We love, I'm really, really taken by this. It's very important and I learn a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Alibe. So uh, people around the room, I give the opportunity for anybody who can stay to stay and people who want to leave, because I know we all have different meetings. We'll stay maybe for another, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes. So everybody was muted before because we can't have everybody speaking at the same time. 
we were giving the floor to the uh, leads and the rapporteurs. I've unmuted people, but you have to ask to speak so we can give you the floor. I see Irene is there. So Irene, um, Bougneville, Matan, you can, uh, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, give us your question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. So uh, my name is Irene Bougainville and I'm from Indonesia. Where's my hand? I can't see my hand. Okay, so um, thank you for the one very wonderful discussion. Uh, my my question is, I think for all who maybe want to answer me. So I think um, it's very important for uh, young people to utilize the social media to spread about this issue because um, I'm I am an advocacy for uh, gender equality and also mental health in my country. But some of my friends they don't really they don't really know that these problems exist. They don't really, they are not really aware. I think mental health oh. and sexual harassment is very, um, there is a high awareness about that in here, but about climate change, they don't really, they don't have any knowledge about it. So how do I uh, engage people who don't know anything about it to make them aware of this issue that really it does exist? Oh, I mean, we should utilize social media and how, how do I, uh, what should I do to do that? And then my next question is, I have ever been a part of an, uh, of an NGO. And I think um, I, I, I had a quite bad experience there where uh, it was a youth NGO, but most of the youths there, they, they, they put their personal benefits um, above uh, the, the real purpose of the NGO itself, which is to help and serve people. I know that it's not wrong to care about our career, personal career in NGO, but it's also important for us to remove all those politics and hierarchy aside and for us to actually care and do things that we are supposed to do in that organization. And after that, I was like very traumatic to join another NGO. So is there any thing that maybe all of you would like to say about this because this is very sad I mean like it should not start from it should stop from the youngest generations because it will continue to be elder generations and that is what's actually happening right now I mean all the things that we are talking about right now they're just they are not really put into action because of all these politics and also hierarchy and also there is still a discrimination and also gender equality gap in those kinds of organizations and are in our universities as well so is there any comment that you would like to add about it? Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, after you might be able to take one or two more and I just have to remind everybody to, to just briefly uh, ask your question. I'm sorry, I had to mute everybody again because we were having interruptions. So I do see two hands. I'll just take two more questions from Fanny and then from Brian. Uh, and so let me hand it over to the team um, who may want to answer very briefly. Thank you. So are there any co-leads who might wanna answer that question or make a comment or should I take the other two? Um, I can I can jump in if, if no one else uh, would like to. Go ahead, um, regarding your first question, I don't think I am well placed to answer that. Uh, we're qualified in any way to answer that. But regarding your second about NGOs and um, and youth, um, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that you've been you've had um, terrible experiences with NGOs, especially youth NGOs. Um, I suppose my only advice that I can really give, and this is coming from uh, someone myself who is who has never fully experienced um, that kind of environment, and the I've luckily never experienced that kind of environment um, in the organisations that I work with. Um, it's incredibly important, I think, to be open about um, about the, I suppose, the toxicity, if you want to use that word, um, in the organizations that you would be incredibly open with the people in them, um, no matter the positions that they are in. It's incredibly important to make sure that you your your discomfort is known, um, and if necessary. Um, please do remove yourself from that situation if you feel you need to. Um, I definitely recommend not giving up. There are definitely youth organizations and NGOs out there who are incredibly committed to furthering youth engagement, to engaging with um, gender equality and so on. 
Um, and um, and it's, it's just, I think, I suppose, um, trying to find the right people to surround yourself with and the right organizations to be involved with. Um, but again, that process of finding them is incredibly difficult. Um, and I can really only wish you luck and, and please, let, um, I can also put my email on the chat as well if you would like to reach out, we can talk about that further as well. Um, but I don't know if anyone else would like to come in on that as well. Um, I would definitely like to hear anyone else's thoughts on that. So thank you, Hannah, for sorry, that. I couldn't have much more help. Thank you, I think that was a great answer. Unfortunately, I can only take one more question and I'll take that to to Fanny Munlin. Fanny, you now have the possibility to unmute yourself for your question. Thank, if you can just thank you. I congratulations. It was a very informative and very educational uh, session. Um, I participated with some young people who had some very good ideas. And Adriana, I think this I'm not pronouncing her name correctly, but she did say, come as your actual self. But the fact is, if you, the first thing you must do is to love who you are and know that you are qualified for whatever position that you are applying for. I mean, that is the key. I work for an international organization and a national organization whose focus is on women and human rights and civil rights. And so it was very, 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 very important and very enlightening. I think everybody is on the right track. I think we should have more discussions. How, and if you want me to help in any way I can, I will. It was very, very good. And the future is in good hands. We are moving forward with great speed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian, uh, we have to sign off now. We're now at 12.15. I hope that you can join us for our next session. Again, I want to thank everybody and any ideas you have in terms of how we can even have more space for more people to speak. As you see, it's a, it takes a village to get this done. And we're very happy to get help and ideas from everybody. I mentioned that there is a link and I think maybe my colleagues might share the screen with the um, survey, if you can kindly fill that out for us. And then also, uh, I think there's some information about our next briefing, which will take place as part of the Commission on the Status of Women. We'll be doing two side events, one on 17 March, which is about nuclear disarmament and the role that women and girls play. And then we have one on the 24th. And this brain of mine can't remember what the topic is. So maybe somebody else on my team can help me out. But that's also a side event for CSW. Anybody know what the 24th is? Yes. Which briefing is it? Swati, Victoria, Judith. Anyway, it's a very special briefing that you're probably going to enjoy. Sorry, um, how, uh, give me one second and I'll... Uh... So I don't feel bad. Everybody has to look it up. We're, we've been planning, I know, we've it's been planning so many sessions. And this, this session felt like a mini conference. <laughs> so we were so occupied. But anyway, um, in the meantime, I want to wish one of our, our leads, Tahil Shama, a very happy birthday. You can use your emoji and wish him happy birthday. It's a special day. Yes, Swati, please tell us. 24th. Yes. So it's a side event and it's called Equal Work, Equal Pay, Reducing the Gender Pay Gap. You're on mute, Hala. I'm saying, how could I forget one? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting one. So the first one is nuclear disarmament, women and girls. And the second one is equal pay and, and, and gender equality. So we look forward to seeing you um, on those two ones and seeing you on um, uh, our different DGC platforms. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed yourself and that you learned something and that you were able to also give something back within your rooms. Thank you so much. I will unmute everybody because I know people like to say, um, uh, but you're unmuted actually, I think. Mm -hmm. Everybody is unmuted. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a great right. day, everybody. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay well. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.
Oh, I can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll end the session now. Bye-bye.